Stepper motors, DC motors, servos, and solenoids. There are so many things to choose from when you want to add some motion to your project, but which one is the most appropriate for a given situation? They all have their own unique quirks, pros, and cons, and weird units like what is torque and what on earth is a kilogram centimeter? Well, all these questions and more are what we're gonna be tackling today. Hey everyone, Jared here. In this guide, we're gonna be talking about some of the most common types of electrical actuators, but we won't be going into precise and detailed instructions on how to wire up and code a microcontroller for these actuators. More so, we'll be looking at the actuators themselves and some applications to hopefully equip you with the ability to know exactly what actuator you need for what job. But that brings up a good question. What is an actuator? Simply put, an actuator is a device that produces motion from energy. DC motors, servos, steppers, solenoids, these are all examples of actuators as they convert electrical energy into movement. Actuators can also be pneumatic, I mean air powered, hydraulic, fluid powered, but we will be sticking with just electrical actuators. There is such a wide range of these to choose from, each with their own abilities and limitations, but in general, you'll find that actuators produce either rotational or linear motion. Linear motion is motion in a straight line. So let's start by looking at linear actuators. Now, the name is a little bit confusing, but when we say linear actuator here, we mean one of these. It has a little DC motor motor in here and a gearbox that converts that rotational motion into nice straight linear motion. Now a linear actuator produces a force. Ah, what a good opportunity to talk a little bit about force. If we go to the data sheet of this linear actuator, we can find that it has a maximum output of 128 newtons. Now, unless you're into physics, a newton isn't really a very intuitive unit of measurement. That's why there exists another much easier unit of force, the kilogram force. One kilogram force is equal to 9.8 newtons, so if we converted this from newtons, we get about 13 kilograms of force. Now that is something that we're used to and we know what it feels like. If you hold a one kilogram weight in your hand, like this one liter bottle of water, it applies one kilogram of force on your hand thanks to gravity. So you can easily imagine what 13 kilograms of force would feel like. So that means if we hold this linear actuator above this set of scales here and extend it, it will read about 13 kilograms. And this is the maximum force that it can output. And of course, this also means you can lift up 13 kilograms with this linear actuator. I'm gonna give you an infinitely helpful little trick here. This printer weighs eight kilos, so we should be able to lift it perfectly fine with our linear actuator. But what if we wanted to push it along the table? How do we know how much force we need? There is quite a bit of math involved in trying to figure that out, but these luggage scales are an incredibly helpful tool in finding this out. So we're gonna wrap our scales around what we want to measure, give it a pull, and as you can see, we need about five kilos of force to move this thing. So 5.5 kilos to move it, our linear actuator here is gonna have no trouble pushing that backwards and forwards. There is a huge selection of linear actuators to choose from. This is a tiny one. It extends in and out about one centimeter and can apply 13 kilograms of force. But there are ones that can extend 10 centimeters, 30 centimeters, even a meter, and be able to output hundreds of kilos of force. But those ones might start to get a bit pricey. Linear actuators tend to have a mechanism called a worm gear. And that is what turns the rotation of the internal DC motor into linear motion. But it also prevents it from going the other way. So I can push as hard as I want on this thing. It's, it's extended out by the way, and it's not gonna budge an inch. It's giving me a nice indent into my hand. Obviously enough force will make it move or more likely break it. But once a linear actuator has extended out to a distance, it really likes to stay there, even when it's not powered on. And we call this the holding force or static loading. I think I should clarify something about linear actuators here. Let's say we put 10 kilograms of force on this thing. If we turn it on, it should easily be able to extend and push it upwards because it can apply 13 kilograms of force. If I put 20 kilograms of force on top of this and turned it on, it wouldn't be able to lift it up at all but it would be able to hold it there because of its holding force, which is about 30 kilos on this thing. We will touch on this soon, but putting the 20 kilo weight on this is called stalling the actuator. 
Linear actuators are also super simple to operate. You can see here we've got two wires, you apply a voltage in one direction, it extends, reverse the voltage, and it retracts. To control this with a microcontroller, you will need a motor driver, as the power it draws is more than the microcontroller can supply. And the setup is super easy, exactly like wiring up a normal DC motor with a motor driver. A great example of a common application of a linear actuator is in one of those sit-stand adjustable desks. You apply a voltage to it and it moves the desk up and down in this nice linear motion. Linear actuators are not always the fastest, but in this situation we really don't care as much about speed. It also has that holding force we were talking about, meaning that we can set it to a height and keep it there for years without powering on the motor. Before we move on, it's probably a good idea to mention that we have a more in-depth guide linked below that also goes over some of the specifications that you will encounter when dealing with each actuator. There was just way too much information to fit into this video. Now let's talk about servos, a wonderful little actuator that produces rotational motion. And this time it will output a rotational force called a torque. What is torque? Well, let's jump over onto the e-glass to have a talk about torque. A torque is a rotational force, and again, when we're dealing with this, you'll see newton meters, which is not very helpful unless you're really into physics. We'll use kilogram centimeters instead, as it's a bit more intuitive. You can kind of think of torque as a, a force being applied at a distance through rotation. Let's say, for example, we had three servos. They're all identical, and they can output 10 kilogram centimeters of force. So let's say we attach an arm to each, and this one, it is one centimeter long. If we allow that arm to rotate and press down on these set of scales here, we will record a force of 10 kilograms at one centimeter. On a five centimeter arm, we will record a force of two kilograms. And on a 10 centimeter arm, we will record a force of one kilogram. So as you can see, if you multiply the distance that it's being applied at by the force it puts down, you get the torque. And that's probably one of the easiest ways to understand torque. And this doesn't have to be an arm, it could be a giant disc. And on the edge of that disc, if it's 10 centimeters wide, you'll be getting about one kilogram of force being applied. There's also another concept called load, which we're gonna talk about. And a load is just a weight or a force or a torque that your actuator must overcome or move. An example of a load is a door in an automatic garage. So the weight of the door itself is a load that the motor in the garage door opener must overcome. Another example, imagine a DC motor. If I were to power it on without a wheel or a pulley or anything connected, it would spin freely and we call this no load conditions. But if I were to grab onto the motor shaft tighter and tighter, I would be applying a greater load to it and it would slow down in speed. And if we were to graph this here with an increasing load on our x-axis here, our speed would go from its highest and linearly go down to its lowest until it stops spinning altogether, and we call that stall conditions. There's also a relationship here with current. So at our no load conditions here, we will be drawing the minimum amount of current. There's always a minimum little operational current. And as we increase the load and speed decreases, our current is gonna linearly increase with it. And here's a very important note. Under stall conditions, you're gonna be drawing the most current and generating the most heat, which is gonna very quickly burn out and damage your actuators. So you wanna keep your actuators away from stall conditions. So, key takeaway, a load is a force or a weight or a torque that we apply to an actuator and it must overcome or move it. As we apply an increasing load, speed drops and current increases. Very, very simple. So, back to servos. They are an extremely popular actuator that specialize in the precise control of position, as they can be set to an exact 
angle. This servo here, for example, I can set it to say 55 degrees. If I turn it off, move it slightly, set it to another angle, and then reset it to 55 degrees, it will return back to that exact position. They also have internal feedback mechanisms to make the servo fight to keep it at the angle that you set it. So I can apply a load and it will fight me to hold it there. If I apply too great of a load for the servo to handle and shift it, if I let go, it's going to revert back to that 55 degree angle. And that is one of the biggest selling points of the servo, how much it just it wants to keep it at the angle that you've set it. However, one of the biggest downsides of using a servo is its limited range. Typically, servos only have about 180 degrees of motion, sometimes more, sometimes less. Another great thing about servos is how easy they are to use. You have three wires here. Two are to supply power to it, and one is to set a PWM signal on, which actually sets the angle of the servo. So you can plug that one straight into your microcontroller and set your desired angles using a servo library. No motor drivers required whatsoever. You shouldn't supply power to the servo off your microcontroller though, again remembering it can't output much power. A great practical example of a servo is in a remote control plane. This obviously isn't a plane, but it is the same mechanism. As the servo rotates, it rotates the control surface of the aircraft through this push rod here. A servo is a prime candidate for this job as we need less than 180 degrees of rotation, we need precise angles to be set, and we want the servo to fight and keep the control surface at the angle that we set it at. DC motors are the simplest of all the actuators. You have two wires, apply a voltage across it, and it generates internal magnetic fields to produce a nice smooth rotational motion. They are the simplest in construction, they come in all sizes and shapes, and are among the cheaper of actuator choices. Now usually these will spin really fast, like hundreds of times a second fast under no load conditions, and that might be great for your project, but at these speeds it actually doesn't produce very much torque, so if you wanted to say put it on your RC car, it might not have enough torque to even move the car forward. That is why it's very common for DC motors to come with gearboxes inbuilt onto the end of them. This will reduce the speed of the motor, but increase the torque. And you will often find a lot of different gear ratios to give you the right torque and speed balance that you need. Again, these typically draw too much power for your microcontroller, so you will need a motor driver, which will power the motor with an external power source, but let you control the speed and direction of the motor with your microcontroller. Super easy stuff. To use the plane example again, a great application of a DC motor is to drive the propeller of the RC plane. We need infinite rotational motion, we don't care about setting exact angles, we just need to be able to control the speed, which we can do reasonably accurately by adjusting the voltage we supply to the motor. We are about to look at steppers, but they are not as suitable as motors here because they don't provide the smooth rotation that DC motors do, and they probably won't be able to spin fast enough. So DC motors are great for anything that needs simple, constant rotational motion that doesn't really care or need precise angles, just spinning. Let's take a look at stepper motors. Now, this one is not like a standard stepper motor form factor. This is a bit of a smaller one with a gearbox, but it still is a stepper motor. Now, these are a different kind of game because they have a unique operation. Stepper motors also generate magnetic fields like motors, but instead of producing that nice smooth rotational motion, it makes the motor want to snap into a position. And inside the motor is a team of coils that work together to then snap it into the next position and then the next one and the next one. And so the stepper motor actually steps forward one position at a time, hence why it's called a stepper motor. And this is the huge difference between them and DC motors. If a DC motor is powered but not spinning, it is stalling, and that will very quickly destroy the motor. But a stepper motor, when it is powered, can hold that position. And that is the beauty of these things. We know how many steps per revolution a motor has. So let's say this one had 200, which is a very common number. If we wanted to move forward 90 degrees, we would step forward 50 steps. And if we wanted to rotate exactly five times backwards, we would step backwards 1000 steps. 
And on top of that, with a bit of clever code, you can actually take partial steps as well. So you can rotate it 50 and a half steps backwards. This is called micro stepping. And with this ability, step motors are kind of the middle ground between a servo and a DC motor. A key difference here between servos and steppers though, is that the stepper doesn't know what position it is currently at. You can only take where it is currently at and move it forward or backwards a precise amount of steps. This means that if I apply too large of a load on a stepper and force it to rotate, it doesn't know that it has slipped. Stepper motors are also a little bit more complex to control. Sometimes there are four wires coming out of it. Sometimes like this one, there's five, or sometimes there might be seven, depending on the design of the motor. We could do an entire video on how to wire one up, but long story short, you will need a stepper motor driver, and that will allow you to use a library on your microcontroller to easily control the direction and speed of the motor. A prime example of a stepper motor application is in 3D printers, where steppers use belts and pulleys to precisely move the print head around. DC motors are ill-suited for this as they don't have the required level of precision, and servos are ill-suited as they have a limited motion. Another great application is in a vending machine. That little spiral that holds your food and drink, that is spun by a stepper motor as it only needs to rotate an exact amount from its current position. And the final actuator on our list is the solenoid. These are beautifully simple actuators that produce nice, and linear motion. A solenoid uses an electromagnet to push away this internal rod here called a plunger, and a spring on the back here pulls it back to its original position when the electromagnet is powered off. They are so simple because they are either on and off and have two positions to represent those states. Typically they don't have much of a throw, which is how far that plunger can travel, and they usually have a throw of about a few millimeters to maybe a few centimeters. However, they do move between these positions incredibly fast, way, way faster than a linear actuator. They aren't, of course, without their downsides, and that is that they don't like to be powered for very long. Usually they can only be powered for like five to 15 seconds at a time, sometimes more, sometimes less, and your data sheet should have this number on it. They also aren't the strongest of actuators. This outputs 13 kilograms of force, and this one puts out half a kilogram of force. Obviously, there are more powerful ones out there, but they tend to be on the weaker side in comparison. As always, these actuators are too powerful for your microcontroller, and so an easy way to control it would be with a MOSFET wired up as a switch. A fantastic example of a solenoid in use is in a pinball machine. That flipper, the little paddle that you whack the ball with, is driven by a solenoid. You only need two positions, extended and retracted. You need it to move quickly between these two, and it isn't a huge distance that it's moving, so a solenoid is Perfect. So solenoids are great for when you need something to move between position A and position B very quickly, but with not too much force. Well, there we have it. Those are five of the most common electrical actuators you will encounter. You should now be equipped with an understanding of each enough to be able to choose which one is appropriate for your next project. Again, we have a bit more of an in-depth guide below. And if you think you know what actuator you want to use, it is worth checking out as we go over some of the specifications you will encounter with those actuators. If you have any questions about actuators or need any clarification, feel free to let us know on our forums. We're all makers here and we're happy to help. Till next time.